Good evening, everyone, and Cade made a fall show to the final talk in the National Archives public lecture series for 2023. I'm Elizabeth McAvoy, and I'm the archivist with responsibility for education and outreach in the National Archives. And on behalf of the office, we're delighted to welcome you here tonight. And for those of you joining us from abroad, an extra special welcome to you all. I'd also like to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Marie Leout. Good evening. Welcome, Marie. Who will present on the Office of the Controller and Auditor General at 100. Before we begin, I'd like to go through just a few housekeeping details so that you can engage with our event. Audience cameras are off and mics are muted, but we actively encourage your participation in tonight's talk using the webinar's Q&A function. Marie's talk will run for roughly 40 minutes with time at the end for Q&A, and you'll have the opportunity to submit your questions during the talk. So please type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of the control panel, as we won't be monitoring the chat box for them. We'll accommodate as many questions as time permits. So apologies in advance if we don't get around to answering yours. We're recording tonight's talk and we'll make it available after the event on our YouTube channel and website, as we have done with all our online talks since early 2021. In fact, the entire suite of our online talks can be accessed on our website at nationalarchives.ie in the Stories from the Archives section. We'll also be live tweeting tonight's talk, so please do like or retweet our posts at NAR Ireland. So, a general intro to tonight's talk. Marie's lecture will discuss the creation of the Office of the Controller and Auditor General in 1923, and will examine how its staff, led by the first post holder, George McGrath, worked towards stabilizing the state in the aftermath of the Civil War. Her talk will also examine the modernization of the office and the challenges it met over the last 100 years of its operation. Challenges such as effective Doyle oversight in the aftermath of the Civil War, resistance against threats to the independence of the office in the 1960s, and the conducting of complex investigations in the 1990s. As for our speaker tonight, Dr. Marie Leuth, Marie graduated from UCD in 2012 with a PhD in history, and has since worked in various institutions, including Marsh's Library and the Royal Irish Academy. She is a qualified archivist, currently working in the National Archives, and has published a number of articles and books, the latest being a booklet marking the centenary of the establishment of the Office of the Controller and Auditor General, in collaboration with the National Archives, the Royal Irish Academy, and the Institute of Public Administration. We're really looking forward to hearing what she has to share with us tonight. So over to you, Marie. Uh, I'm sharing this. Sure. There we are, sorry about this. Right, so good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us for this lecture. So tonight um, I will look at one of the lesser known institutions of the state, the Office of the Controller and Auditor General. So most of us wouldn't be familiar with it, and yet it is a pillar of our democracy. So I don't know if I will cover as much as Elizabeth just said, but I will start with um, the very basic, such as who is the CNEG? What does he do? And then I'll move on to, to the origins of the office, talking about George McGrath and his staff, and then um, through the lens of the staff, um, I will look at its growth over a hundred years and then I'll draw some conclusions. And um, then obviously we'll have um, questions. So um, what is a controller and auditor general? So very basically it's a guardian watching over the proper management of public finances. It ensures that the taxpayer's money is not misspent, embezzled, etc. So he's there to make sure that the law is applied. He's a constitutional officer, which means that he's not a public servant. Um, his, his role is inscribed in the constitution. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. He's a very special person and that guarantees his uh, independence. So 
So he's like the ombudsman, for instance, um, independent, which is very important. So what does the CNAG do? So the first step in all of this is public monies um, are raised through taxation or um, borrowing. This public money then is assigned to various votes. So votes would be um, the, whatever money is allocated to the Department of Education, Department of Health, Department of Transport, whatever. So those are, are known as votes. Um, and then the first part of the controller and auditor um, general uh, part of the job is to release money from the exchequer. So the Minister for Finance cannot just decide, I'll take money from the pot. He has to apply or she has to apply to the controller and auditor general in order to have that money released. So that's the first part of, um, of the job. Then that money is spent on, um, say, building a motorway or whatever. Accounts are kept, so how much is spent on building the motorway and um, presented to um, the CNAG by the accounting officer of each department. So in the example that I said about the motorway, that would be the Department of Transport. So what does the CNAG do then with those accounts? Well, that's the second part of the job, it audits them. So um, they're called appropriation accounts. Um, to assign, to appropriate, it's essentially the same. So they're, they're just, just the term, they're known as appropriation accounts. So it audits them and ensure that the state's expenditure is properly accounted for. So to go back to my motorway, um, say a million euro was decided to be spent on tarmac. Uh, if it's two million, then um, the CNG is going to raise that. Um, then the CNG writes a report. Uh, it does that annually. So that's mostly on the appropriation accounts, but as the role has evolved and uh, augmented, um, there are special reports as well. So for example, um, there are triennial reports for um, specifically to NAMA. Um, so it's not just the, the annual report anymore. So once he has the report, has account um, audited the accounts, um, the last thing that the CNAG will do is to present the report and the audited account to the Public Accounts Committee. So the Public Accounts Committee is uh, a, uh, a committee of Dollaran, and um, it currently has 13 TDs, and its sole raison d'etre really is to um, examine the report and audited accounts um, presented by the CNAG, and then it has powers to um, um, examine and question the accounting officers. It can call um, any persons that it deems um, it needs to, to examine to make sure the accounts are, are in order. Um, and the, the CNAG is a permanent witness. So every time the Public Accounts Committee is meeting, the CNAG will be there. Um, so I have two documents there for you. The first one is the first um, report on appropriation accounts that was published in 1924. So a very special document. Um, I should say as well that if you're interested in reading these, they are available through the website of the CNAG and they make a very interesting read. Um, the second one that I have here is a photograph of uh, our current controller and auditor general, uh, Seamus McCarthy, um, who was just there sitting for um, whatever vote that was, um, housing vote 34. It was, it was recently, it was this year. So I've made this little collage to say, um, we're going to talk about um, 10 CNAGs. So very, very briefly, just there's just one person I don't have a photograph of, but I do have uh, his signature. So the first one was um, George McGrath, who was in office between 23 and 44, and I'm going to be talking about him quite a lot. Uh, succeeded by uh, John Maher, who was there um, between um, 44 and 49. Then we have William Wan, who was there from 49 to 53. Um, William O'Cadler, William Keeley, who was there um, 53 to 64. Um, then we had uh, Mike Gerald, 73 to 81. So you can also guess by the dates that um, what challenges these people had to, to face. For instance, with Mike Gerald, 73, obviously Ireland joins the um, European Union. So that brings um, new sets of audits, for instance. Um, 
Then we have, um, oh, I forgot him, Eugene Suttle, very important CNAG because he was one of the first to push to augment the remit of the, the role. Um, we have Laurie MacDonald, not a very good picture that I have here, but um, from 81 to 94, so you can guess you had to deal with a recession. Um, then we have John Purcell, the man with the, the report. That's actually the report of the DIRT inquiry. Um, so that was um, a very important uh, chapter in the history of the office because the CNG was granted special powers to lead this inquiry. Then we have uh, John Buckley uh, with the blue background, who you can see the dates he was in, in office, um, very difficult years with the crash. Um, and we have our present um, CNG, uh, Seamus McCarthy, there was just last Tuesday when we launched the, the booklet. Um, so the origins of the um, control and auditor general. So the audit of public accounts, it, it's not something new. It doesn't start in 1923. It's been there since at least the 16th century. Uh, at least we have records for that since the 16th century. And the first person who had uh, a role with the title of Auditor General of Ireland was uh, Richard Brazier in 1547. And um, I'm not gonna go too much on the tangent, but I'll just give you a little bit of context for why 1547. Um, with um, um, Henry VIII and the reformation that took place in England in 1534 and in Ireland in 1536, um, because Henry VIII decides to create Anglicanism, he dissolves the monasteries. So everything, all the landed properties, uh, of the Catholic monasteries um, become crown property. And Henry wants to sell that. And he wants to ensure that uh, the proceeds from these sales actually get back to him, to the crown, to the revenue and the exchequer in, in, in England. So in order to have that done and make sure there is no embezzlement, he creates the position Auditor General of Ireland. And when you see the dates, that that's the context for that. And I think it's kind of interesting because um, it, it's always it's always linked to land um, in Ireland that you have uh, positions like that. Um, so that's that's the context for the first one. We know that um, an Auditor General of Ireland was located at Dublin Castle from 1606, 1610, and that leads me to my next. Um, no, not that one. Next slide. So this is a lovely document from the um, from the National Archives. It's a list of officers um, from 1688 to 1727. And you can actually see um, the names of a few of the the controllers well, auditor generals for for that period there. So you see some of them are uh, where there's at least three of them. Um, so obviously functions that would have been probably passed within the same family. And then that brings me to that lovely, lovely slide there. So um, um, I'm also grateful to the OPW to have loaned us this image. This is uh, the back of Dublin Castle. So you see the Chapel Royal right in front and to the right hand side, um, that's the treasury block. So it was built um, between 1713 and 1715. And so we know that the the auditor was there and um, it was there, the office was there until probably 1922. And then uh, the office came back in uh, 1989. So that's, it's been in use for a long time. And you can see here, this date back from um, 1829, uh, that's the floor plan of the treasury block. And you can probably, I don't know if you can see properly, but uh, two of the rooms there on the left um, were for the Auditor General. So it's nice to have a building that goes back that far. Um, so that's another great document from a collection that is close to my heart, the uh, Chief Secretary's Office Registered Papers. Um, and this is a document from 1820. It is, uh, it is a set of accounts that is uh, signed by the uh, Auditor General then, uh, in 1820, that was uh, Robert Jocelyn, the third Earl of Roden. Um, so I don't know if you can see signature there, Auditor General, lovely handwriting. And um, 
since we are in the 19th century, I wanted to just um, spend one minute talking about this. Again, same lovely collection that we have in the National Archives and um, the CSORP, this one's 1820, 21. And these letters there, um, you may or may not have the time to read them, but um, they are about preserving the records of the Auditor General. So as early as um, 1825, there is a sense that these documents related to auditing public monies in Ireland are of importance and they deserve to be to be saved and put in a safe place. Um, so that I, I thought that was a very interesting thing that it's um, now obviously the CNAG's records come to the National Archives, but um, taking care of them is not uh, is not a new thing. So let's start with um, the 20th century. So um in 1922 and uh, the, the the constitution of uh, Sir Stuart Aaron is um agreed on and um a, a constitutional committee meets in um the Shelburne Hotel in, in Dublin so you've got the room where people met and drafted the constitutions debated it it was initially chaired when well, it was chaired by Michael Collins but a lot of the work was done by a man called Daryl Figgis and um, for a number of reasons, um, three draft constitutions were presented um, and people disagreed on, on various points, but there is one thing on which they agreed. It was that the state would have a controller and auditor general, and it was passed. So that's article 62 there. The state has a CNAG who shall report to dollar and at stated period to be determined by law. Um, so that's, uh, one of the first um, important pieces of legislation for us. And then the very first control and auditor general um, of independent Ireland, who we've mentioned him before, is uh, George McGrath. And he served for a very long 21 years um, from the very beginning of the state to uh, 1944, so the emergency. So you can imagine the task that this man had to, um, to start the office to make sure that um, it was functioning properly. And also as uh, Elizabeth mentioned, this is in the aftermath of a civil war. So you can imagine that um, limited revenue because um, industries have been damaged, um, completely new, new system. This is after the union. So Ireland has to find its own feet. We also have the, the main problem at the time is really um, accounting for army spending, um, and that's what McGuire spent a lot of time doing. Um, so that's the man himself, you can see his lovely um, moustache. And um, so a couple of words about him. He was born in um, at 11 Spitalfields in the Liberties in Dublin and went to um, the Christian Brothers School nearby on Francis Street. Um, and uh, we know that he taught Irish there after after graduating himself. So by 1911, he was working as an accountant <clears throat> for um, a, quite a famous accounting firm named Craig Gardner and uh, Company, and uh, number 40 on Dame Street. And a lovely document here for you. And this is also from the National Archives. It's the census for 1911 for um, the McGrath family. And you can see there um, George McGrath, son, Roman Catholic, which is important because he was um, very, very proud to have been the very first Catholic uh, hired by Craig uh, and Gardner. So you can see that obviously he's an accountant, he's single, so he's not married yet, and born in Dublin City. And you can see perhaps in the Irish language column that he has Irish and English and seems to be the only one in his family. Um, so again, that's a, a, quite unimportant. It may seem minor, but when we're talking 1923, we're talking about the creation of a new state, trying to affirm its identity, having the Irish language is, is also very important. Um, and you'll see the last person there on that um, census form is Joseph McGraw, um, son, Roman Catholic, can read and write, he's only 22, commercial clerk. So why am I mentioning him? Because 
Joseph McGrath also worked at Greg Gardner & Co. He is known mostly as Joe McGrath, um, very well known in the racehorse industry. Um, he was one of the founders of the Irish uh, Hospital Sweepstakes. Very importantly, was a member of the treaty uh, delegation in 1921, he was sent to London. And also he was Minister for Industry and Commerce in the 1920s, so a minister um, in the new state. So this is a photograph of um, the uh, Irish delegation in, in London for, for the treaty negotiations. George McGrath is the last person on the left-hand side that's half seated, seated on the couch. Also, obviously, very famous figures there. And another person who was working at Craig and Gardner um, was Michael Collins himself. Um, lovely picture there. Um, is, is not looking too happy. Um, and obviously they, they had a friendship and Collins appointed George McGrath as a Canton General of the First Dollar in 1919. So essentially he's giving him the responsibility of um, looking at the finances of the revolution. So a very important job. Um, so another thing that happens um, even before even before um, the Irish Free State exists. Um, McGrath is sent to Washington in, in the US in November 1922 to learn about state finances. So over there, he meets important people, uh, learns about accounting, financing, um, but to the level of the state, because obviously financial ac accounting for a business or a firm is very different from accounting for the state. And um, at the time, and. This may seem very little for us today, but he's granted 500 euros, 500 pounds for his travels. And that's a huge sum, which also I think um, is, a, is a tribute to the trust that was put in the man, that he would use that money um, rightly, but also it's an investment of the state in this man for him to acquire skills. I absolutely love this passport photograph. You can see that obviously it's issued by the Foreign Office in England. Um, and that's a great photograph that we have of him. So um, once the constitution is adopted, um, legislation is passed. And on the 12th of January, 1923, so 100 years ago, we celebrated the, the anniversary, the Controller and Auditor General Act is, uh, is passed. So because um, CNAG is a constitutional office, you have to legislate for everything then. So obviously the Controller and Auditor General Act of 23 will, uh, will um, state what his duties are and so on and so forth. But it also states how much he's gonna be paid, what age he can retire and, and all of those things. Um, so McGrath is appointed on the same day as the first, unsurprisingly, I suppose, and the first Controller and Auditor General of the Irish Free State. And the other thing that I'm gonna talk about there for a minute is um, the fact that this act is the sixth one that is passed after the adoption of the constitution. So um, very, very early on. And I think that gives a sense of the importance of the CNAG's office, because the first few acts that are passed are making sure that exi existing legislation is going to be continued, uh, making sure that uh, an exchequer or central fund exists so that civil servants can be paid so that you have an apparatus of state. And then very early on, number six is having a system to audit public monies. Uh, again, we're talking um, context, um, aftermath of the war, um, money that has gone astray, um, and especially for the army, I know I insist on that, but a lot of expenses cannot be vouched for. So to have a system of audit uh, and a person who is there to release public money is extremely important. So. I think that's also why I, I, I love the history of the CNAG so much is it's not just an institution, it's it's really the history of, of our state. So um, McGraw worked for 21 years, so he's done a lot. Um, so I've kept this couple of documents there to um, just, just to illustrate that. Um, 
I particularly like the one on the left hand side. It's in the president's collection. So all of that is in the National Archives um, and you can call it up and, and look it for yourselves. Um, so the one on the on on the left is Uktra uh, Nahir, and so it's a brief to the uh, incoming president before he meets George McGrath for the first time. So it's a few notes um, for him to know who he is really, and um, um, it, it's just very simple. But it says before his appointment as Controller and Auditor General on 12 January 1923, Mr. George McGrath had been Accountant General of Dolly from 1919 to 1922. So it's giving its credentials. And then he was a close associate of the late General Michael Collins, under whom he worked when the latter was Minister of Finance of Dollaran. He lives in Rose Hill, Carisfort Avenue in Black Rock, and he's married with two children. And then I, one of my favorite letters, I suppose, is this one there on the right hand side. Sorry, I'm going back. Um, he writes George McGrath um, in 1944, um, this desires to retire. And he's very sick at this stage, and he writes to uh, to the president saying, I, "I wish, I wish to retire." And, I said, and that's the letter that he sends. And you can see the the headed paper of the office, and also his absolutely gorgeous um, signature at the bottom. And again, you see that he's signing as Gaelger. So there is that sense of identity as well that um, is carried through. So now um, the office obviously needed staff to function. And I've, I've decided to focus on, on just three people there that were there in the early years. So uh, you'll tell me, but these pictures are from 1921. They are all taken in London. Why is that? So remember on the picture on the right, you've got Joseph McGrath. And also if you look at the very right hand side, the last woman seated uh, on the couch, dressed in black with her hand on, on her knee is Alice Lyons. And she's also in front of the typewriter there with Kathleen McKenna and her sister, um, Ellie Lyons, and a very famous picture of her and Kathleen McKenna with the cat in London. Um, so Alice Lyons, why is she important? Um, she's one of the very first people to be hired to work in the office. And um, the reason why she was in London was because she was the private typist of Michael Collins when he was in the Department of Finance. So very close associate, somebody who was trusted, um, uh, had been had been there during the War of Independence, um, obviously has skills to offer, is reliable. So she works in the office in the first few years. There's also a woman called Kathleen Galvin that I wanted to talk about because she's one of the few women that we can uh, trace back from 1923 right up to 1954 as working in the office. So she's a career civil servant um, and she serves for longer than McGrath himself. So she serves under four different CNAGs. So the amount of knowledge this woman would have had of how the office worked and, um, you know, how to, how to write a brief, this, that and the other. Um, and knowing as well how the office had evolved. So she would have been um, a, a pillar as well for, for, for new colleagues and so on. So Kathleen Galvin. And then uh, John Maher, you've seen his signature already. Um, I think he's the second person to be hired. So uh, McGrath starts in January. I think he starts early in February, 1923 as um, secretary and director of audit. So the second highest position. And he really he learns uh, everything about state financing, about auditing, and he, he really shadows um, George McGrath to the point that uh, George McGrath becomes quite sick towards the end of his career and he cannot attend the Public Accounts Committee. And John Maher is the one who actually goes and um, and helps the Public Accounts Committee as well with their own um, their own job. I should perhaps have mentioned that, but the, initially the Public Accounts Committee um, is appointed annually, which means that you've got at the time 12 TDs that come in every year and they, most of them would not have been on the committee previously, so they don't really know how it works. And the CNAG, um, with that spirit of partnership and working together, always explains, okay, as a CNAG, this is what I do. As members of the Public Accounts Committee, this is what you do. This is how we write a report and so on. So John Maher would have been quite crucial in continuing that tradition of helping. And um, he's appointed 
so nominated by um, Dollar and, and then appointed by the president uh, in 1944. So three people that I, I picked there. Um, this is another document that I, I quite like. Um, again, to, just to, to insist on the context, um, every single civil servant that started uh, in those years, so we're talking early 20s, had to sign a declaration of fidelity. Um, fidelity. And, and this one is, is signed by uh, Mary Cox of the office. Um, simply says, you know, I do hereby solemnly and sincerely declare that I will at all times bear full and true allegiance to the Irish Free State and its constitution as by law established. So I just thought that's another, this is in the, in the staff files, but I think it's a lovely document because nowadays we would, we would never sign something like that, but it was, it was also to prove that you were, you, 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 you were dedicated to the state and the, the, the new state. Um, another couple of words about women. So it's, it's obviously it's talking about the CNAG, but this would have been valid for the whole civil service. Um, and I've got a new civil servant booklet there from 1954. That kind of just describes what is expected of a civil servant. And it has a, a special part about um, women and what they do. So mostly clerical work. They, they have to retire upon getting married. Um, that's the marriage bar that is lifted in 1973 when Ireland joins the EU. Um, and uh, a lot of them would have been typists and had these clerical jobs, such as you know putting things in envelopes, uh, making sure um, drafts were given here, writing and, and and typing stuff for the auditors. So, the document we have here, um, it's um, it's about two women who were successful in actually passing the the diploma of shorthand typist and typist, and we've got Alice Lyons there. Um, and why am I talking about typists? It's also because women might have been kept to these, um, ent I suppose, entry jobs, clerical jobs that did not require to, to be able to count or whatever, but they were the only ones who could type. So you see sometimes in correspondence, oh, we really need to hire a couple more typists because we just can't deal with the volume. Um, so it means that they were still quite important in, in the hierarchy of, of the office, but mostly of the civil service. So um, when we look at the staff of the office, it also gives us a very good idea of how the state itself is evolving and it's growing. So we've got 26 employees in July 1923. Uh, and again, I got a, a, a lovely document there uh, listing people. Also, you can see that women are, are paid less. Um, they could not be paid more than uh, an unmarried man, obviously on the, the basis that uh, men were supporting their their families. Um, it, it gives you the name of a few people that were there. You can see Alice Lyons. And so we had, besides the controller and auditor general, the secretary and director of audit, you had obviously senior auditors, assistant auditors, audit clerks, clerical officers, typist, a messenger, and we even have a cleaner. I even have the name for that cleaner for the first um, the first staff list. Um, another thing that it's, it's quite good, uh, if you go to the National Archives, <clears throat> in the reading room, you will have um, Tom's directories, um, which is a fantastic resource. And this one is from 1947. And you can actually see who was working the, the, the office. Um, so at the time, it was still based in the College of Science, um, which is the Taoiseach's department, uh, Marion Street. Uh, you can see who was the secretary, you can see who was the senior auditor, and you can see some of the names. Uh, for example, um, we've got Keeley there as deputy director of audit, and we know that he was um, a CNAG later himself. You can see as audit clerk, Miss Kay Galvin, Kathleen, that we were talking about earlier. Um, so it, it's a fantastic source, um, especially if you're interested in, in how the institutions were evolving, growing, how many staff they hired. Um, so by 65, the office had uh, 53 employees. And then um, by the mid 60s, again, the context, there was so much more workload that there was uh, a bit of a fear that the audits could not be completed. They were just delayed because of staff shortages. So the, the post of director of audit dedicated specifically to state-sponsored body was created. So 
it's in response to having a more and more um, money invested in 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 companies and things like that. So, for instance, a few that come to mind would be the CIE, which was the ancestor of Transport for Ireland. Um, there was one for ore and mining. There was one for um, the National Stud. Um, and uh, the, the one, the Irish Steel Company, which was in Hoboland in um, County Cork. So all of these, because there is this state money, have to be audited by the CNAG or is nominated as the main auditor. And these kind of snowball as the state grows. So it, it's a good thing, but at the same time, it means a lot more work uh, and pressure. So that post of director of audit uh, is created then. And you'll see then when later in after the 90s, when the, the value for money remit is created, you also have a director of audit for that. So it's um, you can see how um, the office itself reflects what's going on outside. Um, and so by 76, you've got 75 employees, so 47 audited the votes. So the stuff we were talking about before, uh, the, the, the departments, um, health, transport, um, education, and the like. Um, so 47, so it's still the majority, but you've got 19 employees that work specifically on state-sponsored bodies. Um, and then you've got, as usual, your director, staff, typist, messenger, and a cleaner. Um, so again, um, the office um, was a victim of the recession of the, the, the 1980s. So at the time, in 1980, the office had an approved establishment that so could hire technically 101 people. But there was an embargo on recruitment in the civil service, um, which meant that the, the office was very, very seriously understaffed to the point where, um, and the document that I have there on the right, um, it's uh, it's in the National Archives as well. Um, the, the Public Accounts Committee is alerted by the Controller and the General, and um, it writes a report. So what you see there is the summary of that report from the Public Accounts Committee, from the Chairman, where he says, essentially, uh, we're in a crisis because the CNAG cannot fulfill its constitutional duties and its uh, statutory duties. So it's, it's a fairly, fairly big deal. Um, and also what I find quite interesting, it's a big challenge. In some ways, what the Public Accounts Committee is saying to the Minister for Finance is, um, if you do not release more funds to employ more staff or bring the staff to a higher number, uh, essentially, you, you are impeding the constitutional duties of, of uh, the CNAG. So there is a little bit of back and forth. And in 1984, recruitment is actually allowed um, and um, the staff numbers are brought back to 91, which is still way below the approved establishment of 101. Uh, but I tell you, that's one of the, if you don't have a CNAG, you can't have uh, transparent auditing of public accounts, and that threatens democracy. So um, to, to move on in years as well, we have another uh, another crisis in, uh, in 2008, as you know, and there was another moratorium on recruitment and promotions, uh, which froze the staff at 145. Um, but given the, the, the context, and the precedent of the 1980s, um, and so the, the the establishment of the National Assets Management Agency, NAMA, the Controller and Auditor General was in charge of auditing NAMA. And I don't know if you remember, but it was uh, an enormous amount of work um, and, and a huge agency. So the office was allowed to get back to its uh, established um, establishment of 156 and it was quite exceptional to have that done um, but it, it tells you that lessons were learned in the 80s and also I suppose that the leadership of the CNAG at the time who, who had to deal with NAMA. So um, today and it, again I just wanted to show you how um, the office is kind of leading the way um, with its staff and um, today the office audits um, about 300 bodies um, altogether. That's that's a lot. 
uh, and it has a team of about 200 employees. 50% of the employees now are women and there is no gender pay gap. So we come a long way from the, the civil servants booklet, um, you know, where, where women um, had to stay in clerical um, roles and, and were not paid as much as men. But that, that's just um, one development. So the last thing uh, that I'm going to deal with is the modernization of the office. So um, before 1993, the Control and Auditor General's audit remit was uh, essentially based on the Exchequer and Audit Department Act of 1866. So we're looking at a, um, a, a British statute, um, which to a certain extent is still the basis of, of um, audit today, but it was extremely narrow in its remit. And, and already in the 1920s, if I'm being perfectly honest, it was already being contested that it was so narrow, but it took 90 years for it to, um, to actually be changed. Uh, in 93, there was a complete overall of legislation, uh, which was essentially an acknowledgement of practices that had evolved since 1923. Um, so remember at the beginning, we, we were saying um, the auditor and controller general releases money and audits the votes which is the narrow definition. But uh, obviously with um, international developments, you know, the, uh, in Europe, in the UK, um, in Canada, Australia, all of these countries would have started to broaden their scope and look into um, what's called now value for money, but uh, performance um, and, and so on. So in 1993, and this has been a long time coming, the Controller and Auditor General Amendment Act is, is passed and it enable, enables to better meet the changes in state financing and the subsequent new auditing demands. Um, so it formally conferred additional audit functions that the OCNAG had been pushing for since the 1960s. And I know Elizabeth in her introduction mentioned uh, the 1960s as being a time of challenges. Um, in, in 67, 68, and uh, there was a, a, a bit of a clash between uh, the Department of um, Justice and the Department of Finance, and the CNAG was caught in the middle about access to files. Um, the CNAG at the time, there was three routine files and he was denied access to them. Um, and the accounting officer uh, rightly said at the time, no, look, these files deal with policy, it's outside of your remit as CNAG. I am not giving you those files. So that started that, that discussion about, you know, can the CNAG uh, look for performance, how the money is spent when it's being sent, uh, spent as opposed to just look at the accounts when it's done. So all of that really started in the 60s. Um, so that's it. So that's the right to examine and report on the economy and efficiency with which public monies are spent and how effectiveness is evaluated. So the whole value for money remit uh, was, was won finally in the 90s. I have here as well no commercial bodies. Um, so the 93 legislation was also important because it uh, clarified which state-sponsored bodies the CNAG was going to audit and that removes commercial bodies. Um, with the big exception of NAMA. So a few conclusions. From its inception in 1922 to its current critical role in Irish public life, the Office of the Controller and Auditor General has grown in scope and powers through its first 100 years. And I did briefly mention um, also some of the powers that were um, granted the CNAG during the DIRT inquiry, um, including... Um, um, being able not to stand in, not to be intolerant, to make comments. Um, so that's legislation that was passed. Um, some of it was just for the, the inquiry, but some of it has, was carried uh, further. So over its first decades, the OCNG was constricted by the, this conservative view uh, of its role that we were talking about, the one that's based on the 1866 legislation, which was solely to oversaw the granting of credits on the Exchequer which basically means releasing the money from the exchequer uh, to the Minister of Finance, and then auditing the accounts of the various departments of state after the money is granted and been spent, and to report to the Public Accounts Committee 
highlighting any discrepancies or uh, misspendings. So from the 60s, the OCNAG responded to the increasing volume of audit work arising from a growing state and public sector, as well as the need to adapt to a modernizing society and by international trends towards a, a more far reaching auditing role. So it started to push for a change in legislation then. Um, and I should have mentioned, obviously, when we say growing state and growing public sec sector, we're also talking about um, all sorts of, of benefits, um, you know, that, that you would get um, unemployment benefits and so on and so forth and health and, and so on. Um, so um, this was all brought about by the 1993 Act. Value for money and performance auditing have since become key tasks. So very broad remit now. Computerized audit was implemented and the office has continued its relationship with international counterparts. So these developments have transformed the office into the state of the art constitutional body that it is today. Thank you. Um, thank you very, very much, Marie, for that. Um, You're welcome. And let's just take a look here now at the um, Q&A box. Well, you've obviously answered, I've uh, been extremely comprehensive in dealing with all the points that you said you would, because there is actually one question <laughs> that we will take a look at here from a person is asking here, um, if a country is at war, does the and obviously Ireland is is neutral, but I suppose perhaps this is more theoretical. Uh, does the controller and auditor general's function remain intact, especially if they need to spend very large amounts of money on um complicated military systems quickly? My understanding is that yes, um, because it's all monies that are spent, public monies. So anything that is in the exchequer. Uh, wherever it comes from, either from taxation on citizens or money borrowed from other states or the mm -hmm. IMF or whatever, um, as long as it's it's public money, it has to be audited. It, it doesn't really matter. The the lawyer might might be passing legislation very quickly to release that money. It it doesn't really matter. The context doesn't matter. It will still mm -hmm. come to the hands of the auditor and uh, um, controller and auditor general. That's my understanding now. I'm sure we. Have we have people who have thought about this a lot more than me. Um, but my understanding is that, yes, if it is public money, it has to be audited, regardless of the context. OK, OK. No, thank, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, do we have another question here? Um, same person. Does the control Auditor General have any influence on whether accruals accounting is used instead of cash accounting? I do not know. <laughs> okay, that's the short answer of that. Um, the so the 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 way um, state audit, uh, state accounting is done is is quite different from what you would see um, anywhere else. So that some of the columns are not there. Um, mm -hmm. So it does require it's it's. You couldn't ask an auditor, you know, in in Dublin anywhere to just switch and become uh, an auditor for the state so i'm not sure um if the types of if the types of account you describe would actually be part of what the office sees does that make sense well I, i'm certainly glad that you have an answer to that um <laughs> It's uh, I I'm there. There are obviously some people in in the audience tonight who may perhaps work for, for yes. the, the office. <laughs> they um, probably think, "What is she saying?" <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, the uh, I was just watching and looking at the slides there. Um, what I found just fascinating was that you have the same small number of people cropping up in various sections or various. Um, aspects of Irish life so that you had Alice Lyons who of course as you said was Michael Collins secretary who was one of the typists in the typing pool and so much more uh, for the secretariat 
for the support of the Irish delegation in London in, in 1921. Um, and also that Michael Collins and George McGrath uh, were friends and had worked together in the uh, in the, 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 the Craig and Gardner accounting firm. So they must have all there must have been quite a, a small but very important ne- I suppose nexus of yeah. very, very highly skilled, highly talented people. Um, and I suppose Michael Collins was such a wonderful administrator and had a fantastic head for for maths and accounting and for management. He obviously recognised the talents and the skills of yeah. George McGrath um, and reckoned that he would have been the, the man for the job to have um, undertaken that job at the beginning of you know, the very shaky foundations of the state in the 20s and to have carried it out until I mean, during serious illness for 21 years is is really, really impressive. It really shows the dedication that so Absolutely. many people in the nascent Irish civil service had to establishing and strengthening the uh, the, the, the very early foundations and organ, or organs of a, of, a, of a nascent or an infant state. Um, you know yourself, you must have come across it also, the, the dedication. No, absolutely. Of the you're, you're saying it so well. You're summarising it perfectly. Yeah. Um, and also good to know that uh, there is no gender pay gap with the C, yeah. uh, CNAG now. Um, that uh, you, I suppose really when you had these trailblazing women like Kathleen and, and Alice Lyons, who ta- whose talents were recognised by by Collins and and so on. And it's nice to see that that influence perhaps has continued to make its uh, its I suppose, influence felt, um, and that there is, you know, no pen, uh, gender pay gap, and uh, that's that's also really 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 great great to see. And I suppose as a an archivist, um, wonderful to see also that as early as eighteen twenty five, there was an appreciation of just how important the records were. There was an understanding. That they needed to be that they needed to be preserved. Be kept. And um, I don't know if you had a chance to read it, but um, um, they were kept. The records of the Auditor General were kept um, at the top of the dome of the forecourts. And uh, in one of the letters, there it says, um, uh, "The wind and the dust and the the, the rain and the, they're just there. The elements and it's imperative that they're they're home somewhere." So there was a, a discussion for a couple of years. To have rooms at the King's Inn um, made to uh, to have those documents. So in the end, I think they went to the Custom House, where they uh, unfortunately were burnt in 1921. But um, there was there was still an effort that was made to to have them preserved. Um, so those letters are quite interesting because it's you, you can see the urgency of remove those documents from there. <laughs> Uh, abs- absolutely. I should also say that there have been compliments coming into the Q&A box as well, thanking you for a very informative yeah. and and interesting talk. You certainly have enlivened a topic which perhaps at first impression, you know, people might think, oh, well, <laughs> finance, uh, not always the most, uh, well, not, not always the most accessible, uh, but you certainly yeah. have, have rounded it accessible and your your use and the, the photographs and the images that you've used of the incredible richness, the depth of the richness of the records that we hold in the National Archives and which in many ways have formed the basis for your wonderful uh, booklet. I think it's worth giving that another plug. Um, Marie's uh, centenary anniversary in history of the Controller and Auditor General uh, was um, published and launched last week and uh, is available for purchase certainly on the Royal Irish Academy website. Um, and so certainly huge congratulations and felicitations to uh, to Marie for, for the wonderful achievement. And again, we're really delighted that the records of the National Archives very much play a central role a as a basis not only for the history but to illustrate the the, the book um the book as well so obviously thank you very very much marie for that my pleasure a, thank you more people saying thank you very very much um just before we go i would just of course like to again reiterate uh, my my thanks to to marie um, and to our audience, of course, tonight for, for tuning in and for participating in the Q&A session. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you out there also for not just tuning in to tonight's talk, but for um, supporting us uh, during the year, whether you have been participating in our online talks 
or in our in-person talks in our, our reading room. 2023 has been a really busy year for us. We're anticipating an equally busy year next year. And we're currently planning our lecture series uh, for 2024. And further details of these will be kept, will become available uh, early into the new year. But for the moment, I would just like to say thank you again to Marie. Thank you all very much. We look forward to seeing you again, hopefully in 2024, to continue supporting us in our, our work and our outreach programme. So thank you very much. Good night from Dublin. Gurmila Mahagwiv, August Ihawa. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.